Well, is it true that your bullet can be overstabilized? I've never thought so, but I've never asked a real expert until today on Ron Spomer Outdoors podcast. We have an engineering expert in ballistics, Jeff Seward, and he's going to educate all of us. Jeff, welcome to Ron Spomer Outdoors podcast. I sure am glad to have bumped into you and gotten you on this podcast because I have many questions, as do my listeners, about all sorts of aspects of ballistics. But one that keeps bugging us and keeps popping up is this stability stuff. Yeah, Can you overstabilize a bullet? Can you get too fast of a twist rate? If you could help us with this, we'd sure appreciate it. Now, before you do that, though, Jeff, I just want folks to know about who you are in your book. Jeff has been a ballistics engineer for something like 40 years. He made a career of this, and he's written just a wonderful in-depth book about ballistics. I'm holding it up for the folks who are seeing this on YouTube, but if you're just listening on a podcast, it is called Ammunition Demystified the non Bubba's Guide to How Ammo Really Works, which is a great title because it's not a simple Bubba explanation. He gets into all the engineering details, but man, is it fascinating. And as you can see, it's a pretty substantial book too, running into what, about 400 and some pages. So Jeff Seward's name is spelled S-I-E-W-E-R-T. And with that introduction, Jeff, I am going to turn it over to you and have you explain to us about this stabilization business with bullets. Thank you very much, Ron. It's a pleasure to speak with you today. In terms of gyroscopic stability, it's, you might say, almost impossible to provide too much spin. Um, there are downsides to too much, too much spin, uh, larger group sizes being one of them. Um, but kind of past there, um, not until you get out to very long ranges where other dynamic stability issues might come into play is, uh, is should you really worry about. So now, for, could you hang on for a majority second? Majority of us. Sure. Jeff, you mentioned gyroscopic stability and dynamic stability. I think we probably need to call for a definition of terms on both of these. Okay, so gyroscopic stability is do you have enough spin to keep the pointing nose of the bullet forward? Okay. And that's that that's usually pretty easy to provide. Um dynamic stability is a matter of uh, when you launch the projectile, it's got a little bit of wobble to it. Almost all of them do. There's a little bit of heresy there. Um, dynamic stability means that if if you have some wobble, the wobble will decrease as the bullet traverses its trajectory, goes downrange. Oh, so initially so your so bullet's got a bit of a wobble. Now that's point of the bullet. It's not the entire bullet leaving the flight path, but just the front sort of spinning around or yawing. Yeah, 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 you can think of it as like a child's top when you when you you know you you first release it, it's got a little bit of a wobble and then it goes to sleep. Well, a bullet does essentially the same thing. Okay. Um so once once that the 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 magnitude of the wobble and the direction of the wobble causes flight path disturbances that lead to making the bullets go through more than one hole. Hmm. So it's really the, it's really that wobble that causes the, your groups to be larger than you'd like. Oh, okay. So the wobble now is going to decrease like your top. You've got it spinning really fast coming out of the barrel. That continues to spin that rapidly. Yeah. It's going to deteriorate mm -hmm. though, a bit downrange because of friction, correct? The, the wobble, the wobble will go away, and that's just due to what we would call dynamic damping. The the as long as the balance between two aerodynamic uh moments is in the right direction, that that yaw, that wobble will decrease. It will get smaller as the bullet goes down range. Now it, at very, very long ranges, once the bullets drop to subsonic velocities, that wobble can open up a little bit, but Kind of a three degree, four degree, what we would call a limit cycle. 
is pretty typical for most bullets, whether it's small cal, medium cal, large cal. So how does this translate to your average deer and elk hunter? I mean, do we need to be worried about specifying a specific twist rate in our rifle so that we get the right gyroscopic stability and the right dynamic stability? The, the, the gyroscopic stability, typically, we don't have to worry about at all. Um, the, the gun makers have kind of figured that out for us. As long as you're not trying to push too long a bullet, through too slow a twist, you should be in good shape. Um, you know, trying to try to trying to launch, say, a seventy-five grain, twenty-two caliber bullet in a one and twelve twist is going to be trouble. It's just the bullet's too long. Yeah. Now, I think most of us understand that, and and we're getting good information from the bullet makers who put on their boxes for hand loaders. You know, this bullet is going to need a one and eight twist rate to stabilize Mm -hmm. in most cartridges. Yep. So that's what you sort of base it on. All right. So that makes sense. Now, what about this too much twist initially? You said earlier that there's really not a problem with it. Some guys will say, well, you can spin a fragile bullet, a varmint bullet apart because the jacket is so thin and the lead core splatters out like, like fudge off of a mixer. Does that make sense? Yeah. My, my, my folks in the industry tell me that once the bullet RPMs get up above, get up above oh, about 300,000 RPM, you have the potential to cause the jacket to, to part ways and leave the lead basically like toothpaste on the wall. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, how many bullets are, are spinning at 300 revolutions per minute? Yeah, not, not very many. Not very many. So, and of course, the problem goes away with monolithic bullets. So, yeah, right. Okay. So, w- but what about an inaccuracy component then? If it's spinning too fast, does that mean you mentioned something about maybe you won't get your greatest accuracy with the the shorter bullets spinning too quickly? Yeah. Uh, not so much shorter bullets. Um, bullets that are quote overstabilized. You could probably shoot smaller groups if you back off on the twist. So if you buy a rifle and you have a specific twist rate, you're kind of well served to shoot the bullets that are recommended for that rifle. So like like the like the new the new PRCs, they have they typically have faster twists associated with them, longer bullets, et cetera. Um if you try to shoot a lighter bullet, you're going to get larger groups than you would if you fired that same bullet in a slick and slower. Twist. Okay. Um, usually, usually not a big deal. What What is the larger? How much difference are we looking at in your group sizes? <sighs> the theory would tell you it ought to be linear with the twist rate. So if you go from, um, let's say, a one in ten twist down to a one in eight and a half twist. That's a, about a fifteen percent difference. So that's would, would anybody care if you're instead of your your groups being an inch there or an inch inch point one five? Probably not. Maybe a bench rest target shooter. A bench rest guy would care, but, but most of us hunters would say, "Yeah, good enough. Let's move on." Okay. Well, I, I mean, I, to me, that answers this question of overstabilization. I just think you don't need to worry about overstabilizing. If you buy a rifle with a, a one and seven and a half twist for these really long bullets, and then you decide you want to shoot a more traditional, lighter weight, shorter length bullet, it's not going to screw you up. It's essentially going to work. You might not get that. Go ahead. We need to, we need to make the cat, we need to make the caveat that this is a course for folks who are hunting, not guys who are doing bench rest. If you're doing yeah. bench rest, you want everything right on the edge. Sure. That makes yeah. sense. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, the d- dynamic stability, I think I need a little bit more information on that. That is referencing the bullet going through the sub subsonic transition range. So your, your bullet is flying faster than about 1,000 feet per second. Um, when it breaks underneath that, there's a transition, and then you've got some issues with stability. Yes, there's a there's a thing that the engineers call a Magnus moment that that 
the Magnus Four center pressure can move quite rapidly with angle of attack, with changes in angle of attack at the subsonic Mach numbers, and that causes dynamic stability troubles. Oh, um, no, now I'm going to so, have to. I'm just going to have to interrupt again, Jeff, for another definition of sure. terms. Moment. Um, when I think of a moment, I think of in the moment. We are talking right now in the moment. It doesn't sound like your moment is the same moment as mine. And your angle of attack, I think, might need a little explanation too. Yes. So, so if this is my bullet, okay, I, I, this is the center of gravity where I'm pinching it. But right in the and middle the of the case. Acts, yeah. The, the moment acts either forward of that of the center of gravity or aft of it. Well, then, what is your definition of moment? It's the force times the distance from the projectile center of gravity. So, in engineering terms, a moment is a force. It's a torque. It's, okay. it's a torque. All right. It's a torque. So now, now I think I'm getting closer torque. to understanding. <laughs> so you may okay. continue for us dumb kids in the back of the room. <laughs> Okay, um, so so what happens is that Magnus moment, uh, the, the Magnus four center pressure moves to the back end of the bullet, and it causes the bullet to be dynamically unstable. So that means the bullet flies with a little bit of a persistent wobble. Mm -hmm. And what one bullet does, the next one will do to you know kind of a very small difference. Say the say the average. Uh, limit cycle dynamic instability is on the order of three degrees. Well, all of them will do that to plus or minus a couple tenths of a degree. Mm -hmm. So it's not, from an accuracy or group size standpoint, it's not a whole lot to work with. Okay. And, and every bullet, every bullet that drops to the subsonic velocity regime will experience that dynamic instability. Mm hmm and it's one of the it's it's one of the real problems with the things like the 300 blackout where you launch the thing subsonically mm -hmm. it's uh kind of a you, you you can't avoid the problem mm. so the wobble is happening again at the point of the bullet not at the base the center of gravity is sort of in the middle of the bullet but a little shifted behind especially if you have a long secant ogive you have less weight in the yep. front of the bullet so the heavier weight in the back of the bullet wants to kind of make it tumble it wants to go first is that correct you know, I mean, yes and the spin prevents that that's yeah. that's that's really the gyroscopic stability part the yeah. the dynamic stability part involves other aerodynamic forces and moments Okay, well, you know, it seems to me that most shooters, hunters, see an oblong hole in the paper and they freak out. This bullet is not being stabilized. Do I need a faster twist barrel? What's going on? Is it possible to get less than a perfect circle in a target? The answer is, if you're close to the piece of paper, yes. If you're downrange at considerable distance, pretty unlikely unless you're at a range where the bullet has in fact dropped to subsonic velocity levels. So at that point, the hob along hole would be pretty typical to see, but not a whole lot of, like if you're seeing a sideways imprint in the paper, you, you probably hit the ground or some other object before you got to the, got to the target. No. Uh. But, well, so what's your idea of long range? I mean, far enough to have stabilized. You've got your initial wobble coming out of the barrel till it settles down. When does that settling occur? Yep. That, that settling should be for most, I'm just thinking a little bit here, for most rifle-type bullets, that wobbling should be over by 100 yards. Okay, so you could expect... It should be under... Un, it should be it should be under one degree. Okay. So then you, you ought to be expecting on your 100 yard target, nice round holes. Yeah. And, and, it, and people need to know that if you slant the target, slant the paper a little bit, you're going to ah. get up long holes. Ah, good point. Yes. I'm sure some of that happens. <laughs> Lord knows we've not gotten absolutely. our target squared up to our shooting position. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's great stuff. Now the, 
I'm glad we're doing this this engineering speak <laughs> because when I read a lot of this stuff, I, I'll see these terms and I wonder what they mean. Like the moment that we just covered a moment ago, <laughs> it's a whole left different word in the engineering world than it right. is in the English professor's world. So those definitions are important. Could you help me a little bit then with the yaw definition? I've seen yaw applied, nodding, prescience, different things. Can you kind of describe what um, those are? So, so ballisticians like myself tend to use pitch in the vertical plane and yaw in the horizontal plane, okay. kind of interchangeably. We call them both yaw. And basically, that's a misalignment of the projectile axis with respect to the velocity vector of the bullet going downrange. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so I, I, hope, I hope that's a, a good enough definition for no, it's working for me. I you know I can't guarantee everyone okay, is getting it, but good. if I'm trying to good. picture it in my mind here, then you, you've got your bullet with its sharp point pointing forward. That's the yep. downrange vector. That's correct. And then the tip and of the bullet the nose is wobbles. No, yeah, the nose wobbles around that around that that vector around uh -huh. that motion. And then yep. it settles down to the axis of the bullet, which is the very center of the bullet, ideally, if it's balanced properly. The, the center of the bullet then becomes aligned with the velocity back. Okay. Now, does your bullet fly down range with the point following the curve, <laughs> or does the point always remain straight forward, and then the bullet sort of falls on its belly? Well, it's like this. So as the... As the bullet traverses the trajectory, the trajectory is curved a little bit. The gyroscopic properties of the projectile, because of the curved trajectory, for a right-hand twist barrel, that makes the nose of the bullet point a little bit to the right. That gives a slightly higher pressure on the left side of the bullet, mm -hmm. and that thing causes what folks call spin drift. It's actually... it's from a technical perspective, is called the drift due to yaw repose. So that's what leads to the spin. Oh, great. I'm glad you brought that up because that's real confusing for a lot of folks too. You know, you've got drift. And I have been taught spin drift is not the same as wind deflection. We shouldn't really be calling that's, wind deflection is, drift. No, wind, wind, wind deflection is a separate, a separate item. Um, the, the drift due to yaw repose happens for every trajectory, whether there's wind or not. Okay. So you've got a right twist barrel, throws the bullet out. It's rotating rapidly, gyroscopic stable uh, to the right. And it drifts wind or no wind. It's going to continue to drift to the right because of this yaw you were talking about. Because of the spin rate and, and the gyroscopic properties. That's correct. Interesting. Great. Now what happens when... When wind comes into okay. play, yeah, I've been taught over the years that wind is like <sighs> like water in a stream. You push a two by four across a stream, and the water catches in, and it moves downstream with it. But with bullets, it's not just the wind pushing the bullet at the wind speed; <laughs> it's actually changing the vector or giving the bullet another direction, or what? Um, the the actual wind deflection that you see is proportional to the wind component perpendicular to the projectile line of flight multiplied by a thing known as lag time. And that's the difference in time of flight between the time of flight in air minus the time of flight in a vacuum. In a vacuum? Okay. So if you had in a vacuum, yes. Okay. So if you had no air, the time of flight in the vacuum and the time of fl flight would be the same. And there'd be no there'd be no wind drift. So if you're able to, for instance, put a little rocket motor on the back of the bullet and, and exhaust enough gas to cancel the drag on the bullet, there would be no wind drift. Oh, this um, is very, wow. very, very, very tough to do. Very yeah, tough yeah. to do because the, 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 this is, this has got my, my head spinning a little bit. Okay. So obviously you shoot a bullet into the air and it slows down because of drag. Air drags the bullet and slows it down. And that's why you've got time is, for is, the wind yeah. to drift it. And if you had a vacuum, yep. there's no drag on the bullet. If you started at 3000 feet per second, by golly, you're going to land at 3000 feet per second. 
That, that's correct. That's correct. There's also a thing that operates on the bullet known as initialization jump. And it's a, what we call the right-hand rule. If this is your velocity vector and this is the wind, the jump is in the vertical direction. So if you're shooting in a crosswind and the crosswind is blowing from right to left, okay. you're going to get the bullet, the bullet axis is going to snap up as it leaves the barrel of the rifle. And that's going to cause the bullet to jump vertically hmm. as a result. How much jump? Depends on the bullet, depends on the spin rate, depends on the wind. I mean, there's Naturally. a lot of, there, there's a, <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of things in there. So um, there are a few ballistic calculators that take that into account and uh, account for it correctly. Uh -huh. um, but only, only one that I know of off the top of my head. Which one is it? Hornady Swardoff. That's what I thought was going to be. Hornady Swardoff. Yeah. Yeah. That's really a more mm -hmm. advanced than most that you find. So it's worth looking into, guys. Now, how much are we looking at, though? If your bullet leaves a barrel and it's got that little initial jump from that crosswind, are we talking inches downrange or fractions of a you tenth of an inch? Yeah. So that's so that jump is an angle. And so if it's, well, let's just pick some numbers. If it's an inch at 100 yards, it's going to be 10 inches at 1,000. Okay. Sure. That makes sense. Okay. So, so yeah, that's, um, it's, it's, if you're, if you're the bench rest guy, you have to worry about that stuff. If you're the hunter and you're trying to take game at extended distances, that jump might put you outside the vitals. Wow. So just, just saying. Yeah. Well, and that's an important thing to say because there's a lot of guys who just say, well, look, my, my rifle is dead nuts accurate. I've got a, it shoots a quarter M away and I've got it zero just the way I want it. So I know what my ballistic drop tables are. I can guarantee a hit at 800 yards, but they didn't uh, <laughs> consider what happens with that jump based on a 20 mile an hour right angle wind, right? Yes. Yes. And they may be pretty good at reading the wind, but they have, they will have to take into account that, that, that jump in the vertical direction in order to put a bullet where they want it. Yeah. See, that's something we almost never hear about. Maybe the guys who are just really into the long range shooting are, are calculating it, but. Uh, and, and maybe they, maybe they, maybe they've already got it dialed in. I don't know. I, I yeah, I would imagine. they. No, I, be at. I, I, I'm just starting to play in the long range game here. IRA, so. Uh huh. <laughs> wow, that's really fascinating stuff. Now, I don't want to dwell on the, this bullet stability and downrange flight stuff exclusively here because, mm -hmm. gosh, you've obviously got a lot more information in this book about different aspects of ballistics. And I know one of them, when you start right off, is you can you can get right mm -hmm. down to the primer or the case itself and really dig into it and find out that those can shoot contribute a lot to internal as well as eventually external ballistics in getting your bullets started. Mm -hmm. Would you care to talk a little bit about the significance of the case itself? How does that contribute to performance? Yeah. So the cartridge case itself, there, there are a couple of facets to that. And the, kind of the, the first one that we would really pick on is the variation in say internal volume. And, you know, if you, if you buy cartridge cases from a case provider and they're all one lot, hopefully they are, they've all been made on the same tooling. So the case wall variation ought to be pretty, pretty small. Where the variation really comes in is the, is the, the, the web, essentially the, the, the difference in distance between the base of the cartridge case in the base of the internal cavity. So changes in that dimension can change the internal volume of the cartridge case. And those changes in internal volume can um, change the muzzle velocity, cause variability in the muzzle velocity. Mm -hmm. um, so, so but, but again, from lot to lot, which is why you don't want to mix lots, from lot to lot, there, there may be a bias in, because somebody's changed the tooling. So my experience is for a 
given a lot of cartridge cases, the variation in internal volume is on the order of about three tenths of a percent all part, which if you make the number kind of by itself, that's, that might be responsible for somewhere in the neighborhood of, between, I'm going to say between four and about eight feet per second by itself. Now that's a standard deviation. That's, that's a, a variation that would be typical. Yeah, it sounds like that's not something that a hunter needs to worry about. But we have always been taught as handloaders to use the same brand of ammunition, at least. If you can't get the same lot, don't go mixing your Federals yeah. and Remingtons and Winchesters and Nas or Brass. And that's, and that's a really good point because you, you really you, you don't know what the brand, act, brand A versus brand B um, tooling looks like. And so there's going to be, there's likely to be a big difference in internal volume when you switch brands. Mm -hmm. Within brands, okay, the line's been running for a while. The tools have got some wear on them. It's time to swap them out. And, and where you're going to see the big difference is from one set of tooling to the next set. That's where you're going to see the big difference. And that's where the manufacturer will specify a lot, a lot run made with the same tooling all the way across. Absolutely. Absolutely. They, but, I mean, they're, for the military, for the military, there are aligning rules. I don't know. I have no idea what the commercial guys follow for practice. Yeah. Yes. Well, what about this idea of weighing your cases so that you get roughly the same internal volume? Is that worth the effort? I have done that. And the work that I did showed that there was very poor correlation between cartridge case weight and internal volume. I, it hmm. just, it didn't, it didn't really pan out. It didn't really pan out. It was a nice idea. And, and there, you know, on, let me just say that on probably on large samples of, of cartridge cases, there's some correlation there. But on the couple of hundred that you're going to get for, you know, you buy, a, you buy a couple of bags of brass, you're probably not going to see very good correlation. Okay. Jeff, I've got a, a question about the cartridge really? material itself. You know, people say, can I use nickel coated cases? Can I use mm -hmm. aluminum cases, steel? There's just all sorts mm -hmm. of options out there. How significant yeah. are those? I think it depends on what it is you're concerned about. Or for instance, if, you know, the gun designers worry about four or five different things when it comes to ammunition, firearm interface, they worry about what's the peak bolt load. If it's a lock breech gun, if it's a blowback gun, they worry about net load versus time. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, they, they worry about the residual load at the start of unlock. How hard is the case pushing against the breach? Uh, they worry about the, um, the load when it comes to extract. Do you have enough energy to, to, to pull the thing out? Um, the cases, different case materials behave differently. And, you know, over the years, I've looked at um, brass cartridge cases, aluminum cartridge cases, steel cartridge cases, uh, composite polymer and other materials. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've looked at, I've looked at a kind of a wide range of things over the years. And if I had to pick one that was particularly good for my firearm, I'd pick aluminum probably. Brass mm -hmm. is another good option. Brass has been used forever for, you know, a lot of good reasons. Um, it's, it's, it's reliable. It's robust. The, 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 the only f drawback to brass is you get, you can get a thing known as stress corrosion cracking in brass. If, if you now residual stresses in the, in the brass case that are too high, um, the nitrogen atmosphere inside the cartridge case from propellant off-gassing can cause splits in the cartridge case. And the splits can run partway through the case wall. And then when you fire it, it splits the rest of the way. Every, anytime you've seen um, 
cartridge case with a longitudinal split in it. That longitudinal split's due to stress corrosion crack. Hmm. Yeah, I've seen it a few times, but I had no idea why it would happen. Yeah, and it's it's covered in the book. It's covered in the book. Um, stress corrosion cracking has been around or been known of for a lot of years. And it's just one of the it's it's one of the downsides with brass. You know, high know. weight is one of the reasons. Yes, it's the military is trying to get away from it. So, and it seems to me that's a difficult thing to spot since it sounds like it's internal. The cracking starts inside the case. Yeah, exactly. You can't, you won't be able to know there's a problem until after you've fired the case. Wow. And But yet, the good news is, generally speaking, when those splits occur, they occur kind of mid of the, mid of the, case body main taper and forward mm-hmm. and usually those don't bend to the atmosphere and they don't cause they don't cause any gas wash they usually don't harm the firearm at all yeah yeah the times i've experienced it it, it was a surprise when you brought the case out what, what's this because we didn't hear anything goofy it didn't see any kickback of gases or anything so it was safe right right yeah. right so right. it is there kind of a standard for hand loaders? Like if you've loaded a case to, let's say, a full house load, pretty high pressure and you know, safe levels, but still it's not a light load. Can you get five, eight, 10, 12 loadings before you need to be concerned about this potential cracking? Or should you just go until you see the crack and throw it away? Well, you might see other cracks beforehand. So so cartridge cases particularly metallic, we're going to focus on metallic cartridge cases for the moment. Um, when the pressure comes up in, the, in those cartridge cases, they contact the wall and there's load transfer that happens between the case wall and the chamber in friction through that interface. And that, that contact pressure can relieve pretty close to about half of the aft thrust that would normally be applied to the bolt. So if you lubricate your cartridge cases, you're gonna you're gonna make a gonna have a big increase in in aft thrust as a result of that. Um, so that's why with, if you're a reloader, you need to get your cartridge cases kind of scrupulously clean. Um, mm-hmm. you won't you won't break it on the next shot, but you don't want to feed your rifle. A steady diet of that, right? That's putting pressure on your locking lugs and your bolt, your bolt face and locking lug, that's, and that's has, and 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 the receiver if that's what the or lock extension, depending on how the rifle's set up. Sure, and as you were alluding to earlier, and an auto loading rifle where you've got gas pressure coming <laughs> and driving the mechanism. You really need to be concerned about how much pressure total is involved in all of this for the timing, so you're not coming back too quickly or or not fast enough to cycle the action reliably, and anything else to be concerned about there. Um, the 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 pressure at the gas port is really what drives the timing, and that's that's kind of more a, a function of what bullet weight, what propellant. And the location of the gas port. So there, there's there's probably an optimum location for the gas port. I mean, every time the bullet goes by, you bleed a little bit of gas into a little reservoir up up, you know, closer to the muzzle. Well, your normal shot to shot variation in pressure means that unless you put the port at exactly the right location, there's going to be variation in pressure blood into that into that little reservoir. Sure. Um, the play, the, the optimum spot for that is just about where the propellant burns out. Where does the propellant burn out? Well, that changes based on the bullet weight and the powder that you use along sure. with a couple other, a couple other things like the, the internal volume of the cartridge. So I mean, I, I guess what I'm driving at is if you put a gas port in a specific location for 30 odd six, you're going to have a different optimum location for a 308. Mm-hmm. Now, if you st- and the, the gun makers don't like to change stuff, so 
Yeah, right. Well, if you buy, say, an auto loading 30 out mm-hmm. section, you've got the, the, sta- the hole in wherever they put it. I mean, you don't have any option there. And it's been optimized for uh, 150 grain. And you decide you want to shoot a 220 grain, and you're going to be using a slower burning powder. Is that going to get you in trouble? Or can that rifle I don't think it? it's going to. I don't think it's going to get you in, into trouble. Uh, not anytime soon, anyway. <laughs> so just, there's a bit of just, tolerance there, involved in that. Yeah, there's going to be there's going to be likely with a 220 grain bullet. You're going to. I'm just thinking here a little bit. Uh, you're probably going to see somewhat lower pressures at the port than you would mm-hmm. with a lighter bullet. And you may, but you may see more variability. I haven't made the numbers on that, so I can't, can't yeah. really speak. To that. But it, um, it doesn't sound like it's anything that your average hunter needs to worry about with his auto loading rifle. Just, just be aware that if you see variability in how, let's just say, vigorously the action cycles, that may be the that may be the cause. Yeah, because <laughs> I know guys who shoot the Garand World War II military <laughs> rifle thirty out six. Uh, are concerned yep. about using high pressure loads because it can bend the rod or something. Does that sound like something you're familiar yeah, with? Yeah. So I, I, well, f- for a couple of reasons, I think that's not a big factor. The first of which is the port on the Garand is almost at the muzzle of the gun. Huh. And so you know the 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 pressures are about as low as they can be at that location. So I. I I don't, it would be a, 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 you know, M1A kind of, kind of rifle that would really make me work, you know, where the port's mm-hmm. closer to the chamber. You know, this is an interesting aspect of all of these things. We can get into the fine details and they're wonderfully fun to know. And you can sometimes mm-hmm. apply those to improve your shooting, your, your accuracy, <laughs> which you call in your book dispersion. You don't like the word accuracy, and we're going to get to that here in a I, second. Well, but I think I <laughs> okay. think as hunt, as hunters and common gun owners, uh, we we sometimes fret a little bit too much about all of this stuff. When really the manufacturers have figured it pretty much figured it all out. They're not producing products that are going to blow up on you if you use the right materials, mm-hmm. the right ammo, the right rifle, and everything. You don't you don't fool around, <laughs> mess around, change things up. It's probably all going to work just fine. And generally, that is correct. And <laughs> generally, <laughs> it's well, this one bubble so, decides he's good. Yeah. So, <laughs> so <laughs> I mean, one of the, you know, for 40 years, I made my living um, helping to troubleshoot ammunition. And so, yeah, uh-huh. the I, I, I would have to say the vast majority of issues have been with what, what gun writers, et cetera, your average hunter would call accuracy. It's it's really the group size problems. Uh huh. So, um, yeah. So for me, accuracy is how close is your average point of impact relative to your aim point? Mm-hmm. It's not groups. Group size is a different thing. I we call that dispersion. Dispersion. Yep. So from your aim point where you want your bullet to land dead center, it dis- yep. there's a dispersion to the left or the right, up and down, and then the diameter of that is your group size. And we can talk about what the metrics ought to be too. I mean, lots of folks use extreme spread. I am not a fan of extreme spread for a lot of reasons. Care to elaborate? Well, yeah. So extreme spread is extreme. Okay. You're, you're really very vulnerable to having flyers skew the problem. You're better served, I think, doing some statistics on it and, and using that information to, to proceed, particularly if you're doing load development or site in or, any, or something mm-hmm. like that. Um, a, a little bit of math goes a long way. <laughs> That's where I'm in trouble. A little bit of math is about <laughs> all I can handle. <laughs> uh, so how would someone how would someone like me go about this? I want to develop a good hunting load for my, let's say, a 270 Winchester. 
Um, yeah, if, yeah. if I'm going by extreme spread, the, the good old standard, wow, you know, I've got a one MOA. That's great. That's all I need. How would you get a more accurate depiction of what your rifle's potential is for dropping your bullet on the target every time? Okay. So one of the things that I do, I, I, and we talk in hand motors, we talk in factory ammo, which, which, which. We're, oh gosh, we could go anyway. P you pick it. Okay. So let's say we're doing low development. So we, what I do is I start with a recipe book and I go to Hornaday's or Barnes or, or Sierra's, whoever's bullet I'm using, that's what reloading manual is, is being employed. And I mm -hmm. go to the bullet weight, the bullet weight that's being used and the cartridge that's being used. And I'll go down through the list of powders and I'll, I'll pick, I'll, if it's if if I have powder available, which is a whole nother problem, and now what I'll do is I'll go down through each of those powders and take take the difference between the highest velocity and the lowest velocity for each of those powders, and then divide that by the difference in charge weight, and I'll pick the I'll pick the powder that has the lowest sensitivity to changes in charge weight. Because when I load the cartridges, even if I trickle them, there's going to be minute variations, cartridge to cartridge, to cartridge and charge weight. So if I pick, if I pick the powder that gives me the least sensitivity, I've I've made that error source the smallest I can make. Okay, so f from there, I'll I'll worry about, you know, playing the charge weight. The new charge weight game. Sometimes I'll do a ladder test. If I do a ladder test, I'm not looking for velocity flat spots with one shot. I just, those I don't think are particularly useful. The problem with those is the fact that there is significant amount of variation in engraving force pressure. You know, cramming the bullet into the forcing cone and start moving. There's mm -hmm. enough variation in that to, to kind of really swing the velocity on any given shot, maybe plus minus 20 feet a second. So looking for flat spots in an increasing, you know, single shot increasing ladder test is not useful other than I'm going to then get done with that information and I'm going to plot a line. I'm going to I'm going to have an Excel spreadsheet draw a line through that for me. And I'm going to check to see if the slope of that line lines up with what's in the reloading manual for first thing. I want it close, you know, within a few percent. And then am I above or am I below what the, what the recipe book says? And if I'm below, I'm, I'm happy. If I'm above, I got to really creep up on max charge weight a little more judiciously than I would have other. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's how, I, how, how I'm using that information. Um, mm -hmm. when I go to the range, I'm firing five shot groups and I'm using, uh, a commercial target software. And basically I take a picture of the target and I'm clicking on the holes and I'm letting the software do the, do the statistics for me. And I'm averaging the variation in horizontal and vertical planes. Um, so just just for reference, if you take a three shot group and do extreme spread, the variation in that group to group to group is about sixty percent of the true dispersion. If you just ch if you fire two more shots and you change the metric from extreme spread to the average of the variation in horizontal and vertical, your variation group to group to group drops to about 25% of the true distribution. So, so that's, that's kind of a big reduction in variation. And so that's one of the reasons that I use this, the average of the standard deviation in vertical and horizontal. And that's mm -hmm. something that the software, the software will help you. Now, what software is that? This. Sorry, I'm using on-target software. Mm -hmm. That's that's the brand name. 
and I've been pretty okay. happy. Yeah. Do you think uh, for your your average hunter who's looking or is satisfied with a one MOA rifle, he's he's measuring his group size. It generally drops three in a row inside of a minute of angle. He rarely okay. shoots at any deer more than three times anyway. Um, he's consistent on his first shot out of a cold barrel, and it's pretty much to the same point out of a warm barrel. So he's happy. Is it worth his trouble to do your approach to this precision in his rifle? Okay, so so let's just say the true dispersion is, we'll pick a number an inch. That's fine. If you sight in with three shots, Let's just say your goal is to get within 50% of that one inch dispersion. So it's half an inch, right? The problem with using three shots to sight in, you have only about a 30% chance that the true mean point of impact is going to be within 50% of that, of that, that aim point, that, that zero that you've established. If you go up to say, 15 shots, now you've got an 80% chance that you're going to be within that, that window. Okay. So let's just say you go out and you, you're, you're, uh, you know, uh, a guy who doesn't reload, you go out and you buy a box of bullets, you've got 20 shots. How many need to hunt? Five? Five's a good number to hunt with, right? You'd be much better served, I think, if you took three five shot groups and then average those impacts and zero the rifle there rather than fire three shots, move the crosshairs and then, and then go hunt with that. You might, you might get unpleasantly surprised at, at an extended range. If you can take that approach. Hmm. I, I see what you're saying. You're going to get quite a bit of kickback these days, given the cost of ammunition and the ability, you just where do you find it? You know, too many guys are saying I could only find one box of ammo. I'm not going to shoot 15 cartridges up and then go for the rest of the deer season. But you're saying you're better off shooting those 15 and really finding out what the accuracy potential is of your rifle, and then where, shooting well where, with your last five. It's 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 really a matter of having the correct zero, in my opinion. Yeah, it's really a matter of having the correct zero. So get mm -hmm. get. If you spend those fifteen shots find, finding the true zero within within eighty percent eighty percent chance of finding the true zero, then then you're I think you're probably better off. Mm -hmm. Okay, well that that'll be a hard one for a lot of us to swallow. <laughs> well, a little, little bit of heresy, a little bit of heresy. <laughs> yeah, well that's kind of your job, you know. You're trying to shake things up and. But you're doing it accurately with all of your, your science and, and your engineering. I mean, it can't pretty hard to argue with those sorts of statistics. If you can understand them, which I don't always understand fully, but I'm always trying to bring this information back to the what I call the real world, the average hunter, whether it's uh, you know for small varmints or, or large moose and elk. Um, we all want to make clean shots, clean kills, we like to call it. And yep. we like to, with within our budgets, uh, get mm -hmm. the get and or build the right tools: rifle, scope, ammo, bullet, hand loads. However, we're doing it, uh, we we want to do the best we can if we can afford it. Um, and you know, ten years ago, I would have been all over this and saying, I I'll just keep shooting and shooting until I get it all perfected because there was plenty of supply around. And the cost wasn't all that high, but these days I can't even afford to, to waste my primers, <laughs> let alone the powder and the bullets. Yeah, so I I, I recently acquired a, a a Winchester Model seventy and three hundred Win Mag from a, a friend from church who was getting on in years, and I I I did some load development with cartridges that were reloads, but I didn't know I didn't know the history, didn't know anything about them. I pull them all and I, I reuse the cases with the existing primers. Mm -hmm. And and it was not not what I wanted to do, but it's what had to happen because primers, particularly large rifle magnum primers, have been so hard to come by. Yeah. Yep. 
Well, mm-hmm. this sets up, I think, a return visit with you someday because I know you've written a lot about primers in here, and I think most of our listeners would be surprised, mm-hmm. if not shocked, to find out mm-hmm. how complicated mm-hmm. a simple primer is and how it contributes to the performance of your cartridge. If you'd mm-hmm. be willing to come back someday, Jeff, we'd sure like to have you come back and talk about that and a few other topics because, as I said, with this book, Ammunition mm-hmm. Demystified, there are so mm-hmm. many topics that are so interesting when you dive that deeply into them that I think our listeners would enjoy hearing it. You think you could come back someday? I'd be more than happy to do that. All right. Well, we will put um, a link up for finding this. I'm sure is this book available on the usual places in the stores as well as on Amazon? Amazon and Barnes and Nobles is where it's where it's available. All right. Well, we'll put the, a link up here and, on the and, on the YouTube. And if channel. folks are if folks are interested, they can go visit my website. It's bulletology.com. Um, I've got a bunch of you could call them white papers up there on different topics. Uh, and there are links links there to to buy the book if uh, if that's needed. Excellent. And then one one more time, the website is www.bulletology.com. B u l l e t. Bulletology. Spell the word bullet and then o l g o y on bulletology. Got it. O l o g y. Yep. O l o g y. Got it. Bulletology. All right. Yep. Ladies and gentlemen, that is what it's like to speak to an engineer who knows his ballistics inside and out. I certainly learned something today. I hope you did as well. And we will grab Jeff the next opportunity we get and dive into some more of this stuff. Write in and let us know if this made sense to you and if you've enjoyed it and want to hear more. And we'll try to schedule Jeff for another episode of Ron Spomer Outdoors Podcasts. In the meantime, Uh, Happy and successful hunting to you, Jeff, and to all of our listeners. Keep those uh, comments coming in and let us know what you think. Until next time, this is Ron Spomer. Hunt honest and shoot straight.